Approximately 30 years ago, a beautiful sefer came out in Israel called Migdal Oiz. It was in memory of Rabbi Zriel Zelik Slonim, one of the big Lubavitch Chassidim. A lot of very, very interesting information is in that sefer. And there are a lot of stories there that were written by the older Chassidim in Eretz Yisrael many, many years ago. And one of the stories over there is from the Tzemach Tzedek, the third Lubavitch Rebbe. The Tzemach Tzedek had several children, boys, girls, and they all got married. And they all married the cousins, second cousins, third cousins, uh, also from other chassidish groups. And this, there's a story over there, very interesting, that the Tzemach Tzedek was holding on his laps one of his eniklach, one of his grandchildren. The child must have been four or five years old. And the Tzemach Tzedek asked him, tell me, which Zayda do you like better, me or your other Zayda? Um, it says over there in the Sefer exactly who the other Sefer was, the other Zayda was. So the child answered back, of course the other Zayda. So the Tzemach Tzedek asked him, why? Why do you like the other Zayda better? So the child answered back, you see, the other Zayda, he knows already everything, and you don't know anything. So the Tzemach Tzedek asked him, why do you say that? What makes you say that he knows everything and I don't know anything? So the child answers, very simple. You are constantly learning. Obviously, you don't know anything yet. He, I hardly ever see him learning. That means that he knows everything already. This is how he put it to the Tzemach Tzedek. So the Tzemach Tzedek told him, okay, let's make a test. Pick any of the Sforim, any of the books that are here in the library and test me. And of course, he took out a Sefer and the Tzemach Tzedek told him word for word exactly what it says in that Sefer. Obviously the child, little child, so he obviously didn't see the, uh, the truth behind what he sees. And the same thing I would like to say over here regarding Rashi in Chumash. Rashi in Chumash was written, as he himself says, for a Ben Chumash Lamik, or for a five-year-old child. He wants that every child should be able to understand Chumash. And Rashi explains it on his level. But we cannot make the mistake and think that Rashi was only for a five-year-old child. Rashi has Pshat, Remez, Drush, Sod, Kabbalah, Chsidis, Maise Bepoyal. Everything you need is in Rashi. It's amazing how it's such a, a simple explanation on the one hand, a commentary which is very simple. On the other hand, it is the deepest it has in it unbelievable amount of information in all levels of Torah and especially in what we have to learn in our daily life. So that's why I would like to learn a Pasuk in Rashi this week. And we are going to see that on the simple level, it seems that Rashi is saying something very simple. And then we're going to see that that is not what Rashi is out to tell us. Rashi is out to tell us one of the most fundamental concepts in Yiddishkeit, in Judaism, in Torah, in the creation of the world, and how it encompasses everything which is connected to our daily life. This is what we're going to see now in Rashi. Also, if you remember in the past we discussed that there's a very famous Shalom, the Shneluch Zabris, that he writes that the Kriyasa Torah, the Torah that we read every single Shabbos, is not only connected to that week, it's also connected to the Yomim Toivim, which occur in those weeks. For example, as we said, Dvarim is always before Tisha B'Av, Miketz, um, Vayeshev is always around Hanukkah, and so we have a lot of parshas that are connected to those Yomim Toivim. During the week of Parsha Kisavai, there's the Yom Tov of Chai Elul. Chai Elul means the 18 days in the month of Elul. What happened on Chai Elul? Two very big birthdays. The birthday of the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov was born in Chai Elul. And the Alter Rebbe was born in Chai Elul. The first Rebbe of Chabad, the Alter Rebbe, the Balatanya Vashulchan Aruch, the Rav, he was also born in Chai Elul. So definitely there must be a connection between this Rashi, the Parsha of Pekisovay, and Chai Elul, as we are going to see something phenomenal. And this is all based on Likut Esichis, Volume 9, which is Chelik Tess, pages 152 through 161. And 
other sikhs which are interconnected to this subject. So let's go straight to our um, Pasuk. If you go to your source, it's in um, source number one, our Parsha Kisove, the first Pasuk in the Parsha. The, the Pasuk starts as follows. Behoyo Kisove Yelo Oritz, and it will be when you will come to the land, Asher Hashem Elikecho Noisen Lechonachalo, that the Rebishta is going to give you as an inheritance, Virishto Vyoshavtaba, and you are going to inherit it, possess it, and you're going to settle there. What are you going to do when you get to Echisrol? Comes the Rebishta and says over here, the mitzvah of Bikurim. What is Bikurim? The first fruit that comes out, you have to bring to the Ebishter. And the Pasuk says, You will have to take from the first of your fruit, that the Psukim later say, You should go to the place, Asherif Har Hashem, that the Ebishter will choose, which is the Beis Amikdash, Then there's a whole Nusach over there that you say when you bring the Bikurim. So basically the Pasuk is talking over here about the Mitzvah of Bikurim. Source number two, Rashi. Rashi says, what does it mean in the Pasuk, you're going to inherit it and you're going to settle? Says Rashi, Magid, the Pasuk comes to tell you a very big novelty. What is he coming to tell you? That when did they become obligated to bring the Bikurim? Till after they finished capturing the land and they divided up the land. In other words, the words Vehoyo Kisava Yala the the words when you will come into the land can make you think that as you come into the land of Echisron and all of a sudden you have new fruit, you right away bring it to the Besa Mikdash. Says the Pasik, no. You come to Echisron, you have to wait for another stage. Which is the other stage? Virisht of your Shaftabo. You will settle. Once you will settle, you'll bring the Bikurim. Comes Rashi and says, no, there's another stage. After settling, Magid is coming to tell you that not only settling, you have to wait until after they capture the land and they divide it up. These are the three basic stages. So, because the Pasuk is very vague when you come and settle. So therefore comes Rashi and breaks it up for you. And there are many things in the Taita that we see the Taita will just say in a very general form. And then we have to figure out exactly which stage is the Taita referring to. Um, for example, the, there's a in, very interesting, in 1929, the previous Rebbe made a trip to Eretz Yisrael when he came out of Russia a year before. And then he took a trip to Eretz Yisrael for a few weeks. And he explained, because since he left Russia, and he wanted very much to go to his father's kever in Lubavitch, the Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Rebbe, and obviously he couldn't go back into Russia, so therefore he went to Eretz Yisrael, to the Mekayim Sakdashim. And it's very interesting, there's a whole book on the, the, uh, the diary of that whole trip, and when the previous Rebbe arrived a few stops before Eretz Yisrael, a lot of Rabboni from Eretz Yisrael came to greet him and they went on that same train. As they got to Yerushalayim, there was a whole discussion going on, at what point does the Rebbe have to rip Kriya, rip his clothing, because there's a Din in Shulchan Aruch. Not too many people do it, but there is such a Din in Shulchan Aruch, that when you see Yerushalayim, when you see the place of the Beis Amikdash, you have to rip Kriya. And the previous Rebbe wanted to know at what point exactly, is it when he sees it from the train, or is it when he goes to a certain area, it has to be proximity, or is it when you get to the Choyma, when you get to the wall, etc. So we see that although there's a concept, yeah, when you see Yerushalayim, you have to do Kriya, but that alone can have different stages. The same thing is here. The Rebishta gives the halacha of Bikurim. And we see that there are different stages in coming into Eretz Yisrael. Comes Rashi and says that when do you do have to do Bikurim? At the last stage, after the finished, capturing the whole land and dividing it up. That's what it seems that Rashi is telling us. When we'll start on analyzing this, we will see that this is not what Rashi is telling us. Rashi is out to tell us a total different halacha, as we're going to see very soon. Let's analyze for a moment this concept of um, coming into the land at these stages. We are very in Pasha Gisov, we're almost towards the end of the Torah. We have more than a half a dozen times before in Chumash where the Torah says, Vehoyo and it will be when you come to the land, you should do this or do that, whatever it is. How is it over there? 
when, when does that mean when you come into the land? At what stage? And we will see that Rashi already explained before what it means. And we're going to see that it doesn't necessarily match to what we saw in now in Pasha Gisove. Let's look. Go to your source number three. In Parsha Shlach. Over there is the halacha of, that everybody knows, Chala. Till today we still do the mitzvah of Chala. What does the Rebbe to say? Look in your source number three in Parsha Shlach. Peirik, Tes, Vov, Posuk, Yudzayin. Vaitaber Hashem al Moshe Leimen. The Rebbe to says as follows. Satu Moshe Rabbeinu as follows. Posuk Yudches. Daber al Bnei Yisrael v'martu aleim. Speak to the Yidin and tell them as follows. Bevoyachem el ha'oretz. As you enter the land, normally we say kisovoyu el oritz, when you come in. Here, that's not when you will come in. Bevoyachem, as you enter. Asher ani mevi eschem shomu, as you enter in the land that I'm going to bring you. Posecutes. Vehoyon, bacholchem milechem oritz, when you will eat from the bread of the land. Torim utrum ol Hashem, you should raise a offering for the Ebishter. What kind of offering? Pasuk Chav. Reishi Sari Saseichem, the beginning of your dough. Chalo Tarimu Trumo. You should raise what is called a Chalo. So the Halacha of Chalo, when do the Yidin have to start doing Chalo? When they go into Eretz Yisrael. How? When? As they enter. Comes Rashi and explains it. Look at your source number four. Bevoya Chemelo Oret, says Rashi. Meshuno Biozu Mikol Biyaz Shabbatayra. This entering Eretz Yisrael is different than all the places in the Torah because of it there, there's a different expression. What is the expression all over in the Torah when the Yidin are going to come to Eretz Yisrael? Shebikulo nemar kisovoy kisovoyu. Every time it says kisovoy kisovoyu, when you will come to the land. But over here it says as you enter. So obviously what does kisovoy and kisovoyu mean? Continues Rashi. Lefikoch kulon lemeidoy zumizu. We are going to learn that all the kisavoy and kisavoyu all mean the exact same thing. What do they mean? Continues Rashi. Vekiven sheparat lecha hakosuv be'achas mehen. In one of these kisavoy and kisavoyu, as we're going to learn in a minute, the Torah made it very clear. She'eino elo le'achar Yerushov yeshiva. So what does it mean when you come into the land? After you inherited and you settle, not as you come in, after settling, so to all of them are like that. We're soon going to learn by the laws of a king that it says over there, when you'll come to the land. What does that mean when you come? After you settle? Oh. So from here we know that any time in the Torah, when it says kisovoy or kisovoyu, when you come, what does that mean? Not as you come in, but after you settle. Avol zu, but this one says Rashi, by Chalo, Nemar, Bevoyachem, it says, as you enter. As they walked into Eretz Yisrael and they made the first dough, Nishaivu Bechalo, they right away had to bring Chalo. So what do we see here? Very clearly. When it says, Kisavoyu el when you will come to the land, it doesn't mean when you come into the land right there and then you have to do that mitzvah. It means, Vierishtav Yashavtaba, after you settle. Where do we see that? Then your next source, source number five, in Parsha Shoftim, when we learn the halachas of a king that we read a few weeks ago in the Torah. What does it say over there? When you will come to the land, the Drebishti will give you and you're going to inherit it and you're going to settle. You will say, I would like to appoint to me a king like all the other nations which are around us. So what do we see over here? That the Drebishti says, when you come into Eretz Yisrael, and you settle, then you appoint the king. So from here we understand very clear that whenever in the Torah it says ki sovoy or ki sovoy, when you come, what does that mean? After you settle. So next time the Torah says ki sovoy, when you come to the land and you do whatever, the Torah doesn't have to say which means that after you settle. Why? Because we already learned in Rashi before that a rule in the Torah. When the Torah says when you come to the land, what does that mean? Settle. Therefore, when we come back now to our Pasek, in Parsha Kisavoy, and all of a sudden the Pasek says, Kisavoy, yellow Oretz, and then Virisht of your Shaftabo, and then when you're going to settle, that when you bring Bikurim, ask all the Mefarshim, what is going on here? Why does the Torah have to say again that it means when you settle? 
and that is what Rashi has a problem, and that is why you look in your source number six. That's exactly what the Sif Sechachom says. The Yeshloimar, the Das Rashi Letaretz, when Rashi comes and says, Magid, the Pasuk comes to tell you that you have to wait until after they captured it. Why does Rashi say that? Because Rashi has a question. But why does the Torah say in Parshik Yisrofi, when you come into the land and you settle, when we already learned that, it, that we know that when you come into the land means when you settle. Why? Because we already learned it from the case of the king. Of Kisavoy Olor, it's over there. That it means, Achar Kibush Vechiluk. That it means after they captured the land and they inherited it. And they divided it. Av Hachokens over here also. That's why it says the Sif Sechachomim, Umetaretz. That's why Rashi answers. Magit Shelen Ischaivu Bibikurim. This is what Rashi, the Pasuk is telling us. That you should know that it doesn't mean only settling. It means also when they captured and they divided it up. But this needs a lot of explanation. Because they did not answer the question. Here's a very, very simple question. According to Rashi, it turns out that Vehoyo Kisovelorets means when you come into the land. The Pasuk says it doesn't mean when you come in. What does it mean? Virishtov Yashavtaba. When you settle. Comes Rashi and explains what does it mean settle? After you captured and you divide it up. How, how, how does it normally work? First you settle and then you capture and divide up? Or first you capture and divide up and then you settle? What do you say? Of course. First you capture, then you divide, and then you settle. No. Here it's Fakert. First they come, then they settle, then they go capture, and then they divide. This doesn't make sense. If Rashi wouldn't have said anything, so we would have a little bit of a question, why does the Torah say Virisht of Yashavtaba? Because we already know it from before. Okay, so we have a question. But the Rashi here doesn't answer the question. He makes a bigger question now. He says, that what does it mean to settle? It means after you captured and you divided up. How does this make sense? Not only that. If we look in the words in Rashi, look at your source number two. It says, Rashi, virisht of your shaftabo, you're going to settle in the land. Magid, what does the Pasuk come to tell you? Shalein ischaivu bibikurim, that did not become obligated to bring bikurim. At shekovshu esa'oretz vechilkuha, until they capture the land and they divide it up. Why does Rashi have to say ad shekovshu es ha'oretz vechilkua? That they captured the land. We're talking about the land. The Pasuk says vehoyo kisavoy el ha'oretz. Rashi should have just said ad shekovshu ha vechilkua. Until they captured it and they divided it up. Why does it say shekovshu es ha'oretz vechilkua? Why does he have to say that? So there are some Ephorshim that want to explain all this and they say it's not two separate stages. Virisht of Yashavtabo, settling and capturing and dividing is all the same thing. It's all one period. The Rebbe is saying, It will be when you come to the land and you will settle. And Rashi explains, it says that it means, what does settling mean? Capturing and divided up, dividing up. So it's not two separate times. But if that's the case, then Rashi should have said, Magi, the Pasuk comes to tell us that when do you give Bikurim? After you settle. Achari Yerusha Yeshiva. It seems like the Drashi is dividing here. He's saying there's a period which is called Yerusha Yeshiva, which means settling. It comes Rashi and says, no. I want to tell you that there's a Chiddush here, Magid, that the Pasuk is coming to tell us an unbelievable novelty. That they had to wait until after they captured the land and after they divided up. Why? What is pushing Rashi to make this distinction? It seems like that there's a problem here somewhere that is pushing Rashi to do it. So, there are some Mepharshim that say that's very simple why Rashi does that. If you look in your quote number seven, it's a Gemara in Kedushin. The Gemara in Kedushin says, in Tegedaflamet Zayin Amit Beis, the E cause of Rachamon Melech, we had a problem before, if you remember. We said that by the story of the king, the Torah says, when you come to the land, and you will settle. And we have it not only by the king, we also have it by us, by Bikurim. That it says, and you're going to settle. So the Gemara says, why do you need it twice? Once I have the first one, I understand the second one. Says the Gemara, no. Bikurim is different. Why? 
A king could be, they could wait. They don't need a king right away. And as we see, that it took years until they decided to have a king. Till, till the time of Shaul HaMelech. Bikurim is something they need right away. Because as soon as they come in, they have to start planting to, to get fruit. So I would have thought that what does Vehoyo Kisavel Oretz by Bikurim mean? As soon as you come in, that's what the Torah has to say. Virisht of your Shabtaba. The Torah has to say, no, it's not right away. It's only after you settle. That's why Rashi comes and says you should know that that's why that wait until after Kibush Vechiluk. That's what some Farshim want to say. But really, that doesn't really take care of it. Because that still doesn't answer why does Rashi divide it into two separate things. Settling as one and Kibush Vechiluk, capturing and dividing as another. There are some other Mefarshim that say another reason why Rashi over here says that Bikurim is different. Look at your source number 8. The Sifri on the Pasuk. The Sifri is like the Medrash equivalent. The Gemara, the Medrash. It says, Vehoyo kisave elo aretz. And says the Sifri, Ein vehoyo elo miyad. According to the Sifri, Vehoyo kisave elo aretz means when you come into the land, right there and then you bring Bikurim. Rashi disagrees with that Sifri. That's why Rashi has to go out of his way to say that we don't hold like the Sifri. That the Sifri says that you bring Bikurim right away. We hold with the Gemara, etc. That it means later after Kibush Vechiluk. That's what they're, the Sameh Farshim want to say. Now, how can Rashi argue with the Sifri? That's another whole Sikha in Likut HaSikha's Chelek Lamedalet. We are not even going to touch that today. But there's a whole beautiful explanation on what the Sifri holds and what Rashi holds, and how not necessarily is there an argument there, but that's another whole thing. But that still doesn't answer our question. Our question is, the Pasuk says, Virishtav Yoshavtabo means you will settle. Comes Rashi and says that, what does it mean? Kibush Vichiluk. It means capturing and dividing up. Why? Why does Rashi change from what the Pasuk means on the very simple level. As Rashi himself explained before, that Virishto Vishaftabo means regular settling. So obviously, there must be something here that Rashi is trying to bring out. And as usual, the answer is always in one or two words that we have to see exactly what those words mean, analyze them properly, based on how Rashi explained it to us in Psukim before, and then everything comes out beautiful, and we're going to see the unbelievable message that Rashi is going to bring out. Let's analyze the two words, kibush v'chiluk, capturing Eretz Yisrael and dividing up Eretz Yisrael. Let's see how that works. Look in your source number nine. Source number nine goes back to Parsha Matos a few weeks ago in the Torah. And if you remember, we learned a beautiful sikha on Parsha Matos, which dealt with the Bnei God, the Bnei Reuven, who they wanted to have a portion on the other side of Eretz Yisrael, on the other side of the Yarden. They came to Moshe Rabbeinu, they said that we have a lot of cattle, we want to stay on this side. Moshe Rabbeinu got angry, he didn't like so much what they're saying. They came and they said, no, no, chas v'shalom, we're planning to go and help all the Yidden when they take over Eretz Yisrael, we'll be with them. When Moshe Rabbeinu heard that, okay, so he agreed. So what does it say there? Matos in Peri Klamet Beis, Pasik Chav Dalet. Moshe Rabbeinu tells the Bnei God Bnei Reuven, Bnu lachem arim letapchem, build houses for your children, ugdeires letzenachem, and uh, uh, barns for your cattle, vehayoytze mipichem tasu. And what comes out of your mouth, you should do. What is came out from their mouth that they should do? Rashi says Rashi, vehayoytze mipichem tasu. Whatever came out of your mouth, you should do. Legavoya to the Eibushter, shekibalte malechem. You accept it upon yourself. Laaver la milchama to go across into Eretz Yisrael to do the war, ad kibush vechiluk until the Yidden capture the land and they divide it up. Shemoi shelo bikish mehem. Moish Rabbeinu only asked elo venich b'shavachar toshuv. He asked them be there when they have to capture the land. Then you could go back. Vehem, but Bnei God Bnei Reuven went a step further. They accepted upon themselves to go to Eretz Yisrael and help the Yid. Not only capturing, they will wait until everyone will get their portion. They added to stay in Eretz Yisrael, the seven years that they divided up Eretz Yisrael, and that's what they did. So we see here clearly that Rashi makes it very clear. How many years was the Chalukah? The dividing up, it took seven years. How many years was the kibush? Rashi didn't say it. 
Let's look at source number 10. This is already in Parshat A. In Parshat A, where the Torah discusses where you are allowed to bring karbonis, where you're not allowed to bring karbonis, says the Rebishter, when you get to Eretz Yisrael, Loisasun kechoy lasher anachnu oisim poi hayoim. You shouldn't do like you everybody what you like what you're doing today. Ish kol yosher be'enav. Everyone does whatever he wants. What does that mean? Everybody does whatever he wants. This is again the A. Perik Yud Beis Pasuk Ches says Rashi Musaf Lemailo. This goes on what it says a few pesukim before. What does it say before? Al Ki Atem Over Mesayarden. You are going to go over the Yarden to Eretz Yisrael. So what's going to happen then? Kesheta Vru Esayarden. When you are going to go over the Yarden, Miyad Mutarim Atem Lehakriv Beboma. Right away, you will be allowed to bring carbonus on a bomo. A bomo is the little mizbeach that people would have in the back of their houses. In other words, they don't necessarily have to bring the carbon to the Beis Amikdash, to the Mishkan. They could bring it on a bomo. bomo. When? Kol Yudalid Shona Shel Kibush Vechiluk. The 14 years that they captured the land and they divided it up. So now we see very clearly that Rashi says there were seven years that they captured, seven years that they divided. Let's continue. Source number 11. In Yeshua, Perik Tezvav Pasuk Aleph, after the seven years that they captured, so they started now making the Geirel a lot, who gets what? So the first lot, Vayiha Geirel Lamate Bnei Yehuda. They made a Geirel, and that was for the Shevet of Yehuda. Next Perik, source number 12, Yeshua Tezayin, Pasuk Aleph, Vayetze HaGeirel Livnei Yosef. To the children of Yosef, Menashe, etc. But, uh, source 13, Yeshua Perikut Ches, two, two prokim later, Pasuk Aleph, Vayakhilu Koladaz Bnei Israel, and the Yidden gathered, Vayivostru Mi Bnei Israel, Asher Loicholkos Nachalosam, Shiv Oshvotim. How many Shvotim remained that they did not yet get their part? Another seven. Which means it didn't happen that for seven years they captured, and then within the next few months they divided up the whole Eretz Yisrael for all the Yidden. How did it work? It took a while. First was Yehuda, and then was Yosef. It took seven years until all the Shvatim received their portion in Eretz Yisrael. What comes out of it according to this? Now we're going to start understanding a little bit what Rashi is saying. The first half at least. Rashi is making a very important statement. The Yidden are coming into Eretz Yisrael. They captured Eretz Yisrael. And now they have to wait another seven years to be able to bring Bikurim. Because they have to wait until Sheva Shekov Shuv Shecholk, with the seven years of capturing, seven years of dividing up. Wait a minute. Shevet Yehuda. They got their portion the first year of the dividing, which is in the eighth year. Can they bring their Bikurim right now? They already settled. They already have their land. They started plowing and seeding. Now the first fruits come out and they want to bring their Bikurim. They want to go and thank the Hebishter. Says Rashi, no. You cannot. Magid. The posse comes to say, Shalein is be Bikurim. When were they obligated to bring Bikurim? Until after it was all divided up that every single Shevet received their portion in Eretz Yisrael. So now comes an unbelievable question. Rashi is saying that Shevet Yehuda had land for six years. They enjoyed the fruit and they weren't allowed to bring Bikurim. Wait, let's figure this out. Look at your source number 14. Source number 14 is the third Pasuk in our Parsha, in Pasuk Yisavi, Pasuk Gimel. When you have your Bikurim, you should come to the Koyen, which is going to be around in those days, and you should tell him, I'm bringing my Bikurim to the Ebrishter, and I'm saying, I'm making the following declaration. That I came to the land. Thank you, Hashem, that you gave me such a beautiful land. Says Rashi, what does it mean, Velmar Toil, if you're going to tell him? You're not a resentful person. You're coming to say thank you, Hashem. Imagine someone gives you an unbelievable present and you don't say thank you. 
that's the worst thing you could do. You're a kfui taiva, you're a resentful person. That's not how you deal, that's not etiquette. The proper thing is, someone gives you something, you say thank you. That's why the Rebishta said, you bring Bikurim. Why? Because you're coming and making a declaration to the Rebishta that you're trying to say thank you. Not only that, Rashi continues further. He got the Tihayim. What does it mean I say I'm coming today? It says Rashi, Pam Achas Bashona Veloishtepeamim. You come once a year and not twice. Why only once a year? Because the whole concept of Bikurim is a concept of Simcha, of joy, as we're going to see in the next source. And therefore, if you do it twice a year, then it's not so joyful. If you do it once a year, oh, that's a big Simcha. Let's look at the next quote, the next source in number 15. At the end it says, You should be happy, you should rejoice for all the good that the Rebishti gave you. It says Rashi, Mikan Omru. From here we learn, that we read Bikurim only in a time of joy. When is that? From Shavuos until Sukkot. Why? Because that's the time when the person gathers all his crop, his wine, his, his oil, and his peiris, etc. So we see that it's a concept of Simcha. So why do we bring Bikurim? Because we're happy and we want to show the Rebbe that we're not resentful, we're not Kfu Yeteva. Come, save it to Yehuda. And they already have their land and they're begging Hashem, we want to bring Bikurim. We want to thank the Rebbe Says Rashi, no. The Rebbe says, I don't want your thanks. Why not? There are still people that don't have their portion of land. What good does it do that you're thank you for yours when there's somebody else who doesn't have yet? Therefore comes Rashi and says, the whole mitzvah of Bikurim is what? To thank the Eibishter. True, says the Eibishter, you know when you can thank me. After the whole land is divided up and everyone has his portion. As long as you have your land, you have all the goodies. But there's one Yid at the other end of Eretz Yisrael, at the other end of who knows where who doesn't have his portion, you can't thank the Eibisht. This is what Rashi is saying. Magid, the Pasuk comes to tell us, until they divided up the whole land, and they divided up, and everybody has their portion. This is the Chiddush that Rashi wants to bring out. Don't thank the Eibisht if there's somebody else who doesn't have. And this is the epitome of the concept of Ahava Sisra, because the Rebishta wants that everybody should be together as we're going to see something, some very nice insights into this Rashi here. And now we understand the connection to the concept of Chai Elul, which is the birthday of the Baal Shem Tev and the Alter Rebbe. One of the fundamental concepts in Hasidus, the Baal Shem Tev is the one that founded the general movement of Hasidus. The Alter Rebbe is the one that started the movement of Hasidus Chabad, the intellectual part of Hasidus. We discussed it in a different occasion, what is the difference between the Baal Shem Tov and the Alter Rebbe, but in a one-liner, the Baal Shem Tov, he came and he innovated the idea that every single Yid can serve Hashem. Before the Baal Shem Tov, there were outcasts and the great scholars. The Baal Shem Tov came and said, no, everyone can serve Hashem. And he explained the concept of the Neshama, etc., as we discussed in a different occasion. The Alter Rebbe, there was two generations after the Baal Shem Tov, in between was the Mizritcha Magid. The Alter Rebbe, he came and explained how every Yid can serve Hashem. When he wrote the Sefer of Tanya, and then Lekut Teir and Teroir, etc. So, what is one of the foundations of the whole concept of Hasidus? Is the concept which is called Ahavas Yisrael, which means unconditional love for another Jew, which this is what Rashi is discussing over here. As long as there's another Jew who's missing something, you should be missing at the same time. Where do we see this, that the Alter Rebbe and the Baal Shem Tov, this was the fundamental issue? If you look at number, at source number 16, this is a Likutu Diburim, this is the Sichis of the previous Rebbe, on page 770, believe it or not, it's on page 770, 
And over there, it brings what was the tzavod, the will that the father of the Baal Shem Tov told the Baal Shem Tov. It's a whole story how the Baal Shem Tov was a little boy. He had lost his mother and was very little. And then his father also passed away when he was a little boy of just a few years old. And his father told him as follows. Look at you, number 16. Mein Kind, my dear child, you should love with the whole deepness of your heart and with the flame of the neshama Yedn Eden, every single Jew, on Cain Untershade, without any difference. Whoever it may be and whatever he looks like. Unconditional love for every single Jew, regardless of who he is, what his background is, etc. This was the tzavod, the will that the father of the Baal Shem Tev gave to the Baal Shem Tev, and the Baal Shem Tev spent his whole life promoting this concept. Unconditional love for every single Jew. The general concept. Came the Alter Rebbe. Number 17, your source number 17. And he wrote the Sefer Atanya. In Tanya Perik Lev, in chapter number 32, which in Hebrew means Lev, the heart, says the Alter Rebbe. This is a whole chapter devoted only to the concept of Abbas Yisrael. Says the Alter Rebbe. Beshegam shikula masimais ve'av echad lekulana. All the neshamas are alike. They all come from the same source. Ve'lochein nikru kol Yisrael achim mamish. All the yidn are called brothers. Why? Mitzat sheirish nafsham b'Hashem echad. Because their source of their neshamas comes from where? From the Eibushtin, which is called Hashem echad. Rak shehagufi mechulakim. Their bodies are divided. But their source is all one. That is why the Yidin are called brothers. And that is why the Rebishte could give the Yidin a mitzvah. You should love your fellow as yourself. Why? Because we are all just like brothers. And we all come from one source. So the question is, why did the Rebishte do it this way? That there's a source where everybody's together and then comes down. And they are all divided. Because the Rebishte wants a concept which is called, there's... Unity. What is the greatness of unity? Unity, the greatness is that when there's a multitude and they all get together, that is the beauty of unity. When there's only one person, so there's no, nothing interesting here. One person thinks one way and that's it. When there are people that have their different opinions and different ways how to look at it, and they all join in together, that is the concept of unity. The concept of achdus. And even the goyim lehavdil understand that there's a beauty in the concept of unity of achdus. As you can see, even our dear country, the United States of America, which is a Malchus Shel Chesed. On their dollar bill, they have something which is right there in the front, in God we trust. And then on the side here, they have a few words in Latin, which say, E pluribus unum. What is a pluribus unum? For those of you who don't speak Latin, pluribus means plural, unum means one. From the multitude we make one. This is what the founding fathers of this country made that although we all think differently, if everybody follows one because of tyranny, because of a dictatorship, that's not called beauty. That is called, they have no choice. When is the beauty of unity? When people with different minds, different ways of thinking, they all join in together in one idea, that's the beauty. And that's why when the Rebishter, when Moshe Rabbeinu told the Rebishter, you have to appoint someone who's going to take my place, what did he say? And the Altarebbe brings this in Tanya in the Hakdama, in the introduction. Moshe Rabbeinu said, I need you to appoint somebody, Ish Asher Ruach Boy, a person who has a very good spirit. What is that Ruach Boy? Says the Medrash, that he can understand each person and everyone can feel the connection to him although they all have different ways how to lead their own life and they have different ways of thinking ain't they the same shavis their way of thinking is different but when it comes to the leader they are all united they're all with him that's the beauty of achdus and that is why the Alter Rebbe and the Baal Shem Tov brought out this concept of Avas Yisrael. Why? Because we have to bring Achdus. Why did the Rebbe just say that he wants Achdus? What for? Why didn't he make it that we should all be together just like in the source? Here we come to Chai El. 
which answers this question, and then we will see the beauty of Rashi. Chai Elul is the day that we said before that the Alter Rebbe was born and the Balshemta was born. The Balshemta was born in the year Nachas, Tof Nun Ches, which in the uh, civil dates it's the year 1745. The, Balsh the Alter Rebbe was born that same day on Chayel, 47 years later, in the year Tov Kuf Hei, which is equivalent to 1698. So, how old was the Baal Shem Tev when the Alter Rebbe was born? In other words, on the birthday of the Baal Shem Tev, the Alter Rebbe was born, how old did he become that day? 47. There's a beautiful minhag, a custom, in Chabad, Look at your source, number 18. We're going to see the minhag in the source. There's a Igres Kedesh von Adum Arayatz. There's a letter from the previous Rebbe in Chelik Yud, in the 10th volume of his letters, on page Nun Gimel. Admur Azokein Kibel Meraboi Beshem Raboi Meireina Bal Shem Tov. The Alter Rebbe received from his Rebbe, the Mezich Magid, who received from the Bal Shem Tov, Loimar ha kapitel Tehilim to say the chapter of Tehilim, Hamasim lemis parshnoisov achat filas shachris. After shachris in the morning, everyone should say the kapitel Tehilim, which corresponds to his age. What does that mean? Pirush, keshen ismalu loy ledug meyud gimel shana. When someone turns thirteen years old, which Perik does he say? Not Perik yud gimel Perik thirteen. Maschel kapitel yud dalit. He says Perik fourteen. Because when a person is born, on that first day, the first year, his father says Kapitel Aleph, because he's now in the first year. When he turns 13, now he's saying the 14th Kapitel. So if a person turned 47, which Kapitel till him does he say? Kapitel 48. So the Baal Shem Tev, on the day that the Alter Rebbe was born, which Kapitel did he say? Kapitel 48. What is it saying, Kapitel 48? Look at your source, number 19. This is a Pasuk, Perik in Tehillim, Memches, Pasuk Beis. By the way, this is a chapter that we say every Monday, Hayoyim, Mshani, Vashambos, we say this Perik. The Pasuk says, Godol Havaye umhul al me'oid be'ir alekeinu. The Rebushter, Havaye, is Godol, is great, be'ir alekeinu. In the city of the Ebushter. Where is the city of the Ebushter? Says the Zohar, when is the Rebish the great? When is he great? When he is in Ir in the city of Elokeinu. What does that mean? This is one of the deepest concepts in Chesidus. I'm just going to say it very briefly. If you notice, the Pasuk starts with the Shem's name Havaya and finishes off with Elohim. Godel Havaya umhulul ma'id, the Rebish Havaya is great where? Be'ir Elokeinu, in the year of Elokeinu. What is the difference between the two? The name Havaya of the Abishter is the name of the Abishter which is above the worlds. It's still not, it has, is not connected to the mundane worlds, to the physical worlds. The name Elohim, that is already a name which that Ebishter creates the world with. As it says, Bereish is bara Elikim. It doesn't say Bereish is bara Hashem. It says Bereish is bara Elikim. When we have to show our commitment to the Ebishter, what do we say? Shema Yisrael Havaye Elikeinu. But when we only talk about the creation, we say Bereish is bara Elikim. Now, we're not going to go in here why the Ebishter created the world, but we all know that he created the world because he wanted to have a dwelling place. So, there's basically two stages here. There's the spiritual part of the Ebishter, which is above the worlds, and then is how the Ebishter creates the world. For whatever reason, the way the Ebishter wanted, that the Ebishter is something unique, one, a oneness, the complete oneness, from the oneness should be millions and billions of creatures. This multitude of creatures should all get together and recognize the greatness of the Ebishter. And this is what this Pasuk says. Godul Havayim Hulul Mu'id. When does Havaye feel greatness? Be'ir Eloikeinu. What's a ir? A city. What does a city mean? As the more houses there are, the bigger and beautiful the city is. So when there's a multitude of things, ir, a city, houses, and they all recognize the Ebishter, that is where the Ebishter feels his greatness. Godul Hashem Hulul Mu'id. And that is why there's a very famous question in Teiras Achsidus, which is discussed in many Maimorim. 
Eich me'ach du sapshuta nishavu riboyan ivroim. How is it that from the oneness of the Ebishter there are so many creatures? Because many is sort of a contradiction to the Ebishter, because the Ebishter is one. Comes the Ebishter and says, no, it's not a contradiction. On the contrary, unity is what the Rebishter is looking for. When the Rebishter has a world which has so many different things, and all these things, the Yidden come and cultivate them, and prepare them, that they should realize that there is an Rebishter, that is when the Rebishter becomes God del Havaya, a great Rebishter. So, therefore, what is the bottom line? That we have to take the Rebishter, bring him here into this world, and show the world what the Rebishter is, until the point that the world recognizes the Ebishter. And that's why if you look at number 20, it's a Pasuk in Chumash and Rashi. Havaye is one. What is Elohim? What does it say in Perik Chav, Pasuk Yud Gimel, in Pashas Vayera, in Rashi, where Avram Avinu says, Kasher Hisu Oisi Elohim, says Rashi, Kol Elohim Lashen Rabim. Elohim is something which shows a multitude. And this is where the Ebishter has his Nachas. When the world, the physical world, recognizes the Ebishter, a pluribus unum, that is when the Ebishter becomes God del Havai. And that is why we see that in order to reach this achdus in the world, which in the expression of Hasidus is called birur hanitzutzus, which means that we refine the world to the point that we recognize the Ebishter, the first thing that has to be is achdus Yisrael. When the Yidin show Achdus, when the Yidin are united, automatically they will be able to get the world also to become united because they set the example. That is why we see when we make a bracha, what do we say? Baruch atah Hashem Eloikeinu Melech HaOilam. We don't say Baruch atah Hashem Eloikim Melech HaOilam. No. What do we say when we want to bring down Baruch atah Hashem, we want to bring down the Rebbe Shtehir in this world, when we make a bracha, we take something physical and we bless it. What do we say? Baruch Ato Hashem, the Havaya, Eloi Keinu, our God, which means we are all Be'achdus. Through that, that we are Be'achdus, Melech Ha'olam, the Rebbe becomes the king of all over the world. And also in the first Pasuk in the Torah, if you look in Bereshis, Right in the beginning, what does it say? Bereshis, when the Rebbe created the world, Bishvil HaToyra, or Bishvil Yisrael. When the Yidin are Be'achdus, they make that it should be Eloikeinu, that the Rebbe becomes one here on this earth, and automatically it becomes all over the world. So that's why, when it comes to the Mitzvah of Bikurim, what does the Rebbe say? And this is what Rashi is telling us. When you will come to the land which the Rebishta gives you, what do you have to do? You're going to have to settle there. How are you going to settle? You're going to capture the land, you're going to divide it up, and every single Jew is going to have his portion. Once everybody has their portion, that's when you can start bringing Bikurim and uh, thank the Eberstein and saying, Eberstein, you gave us a job to take this world and complete it and make it beautiful for you. We have done it. Here is our Bikurim to show it to you. So now we see how this Rashi is a fundamental concept. It's saying, how is the world going to get to his completion? You will, you, you will come to the land that the Rebishter created, that this is what the Rebishter is looking for. There's two steps. Step number one is that all Yidin must be united. And there's no such thing as a Yid bringing his own Bikurim, thanking the Rebishter for his lot if there's still someone else who doesn't have it. No, the first thing that has to be is Avas Yisrael, Achdus Yisrael. Once the Yidin have Achdus Yisrael, Bechil Kuha, everyone got his portion, oh, then we could start bringing Bikurim and say to the Rebishten that thank you for the land, we're giving you back this beautiful land. So now we see that we have the three Shleimusen, the three completeness. The Shleimus Ha'aretz, the land now is complete, it belongs to the Yidin, unquestionable. Shleimus Ha'am, the whole nation of the Yidin is complete because they are all together. And Shleimus Ha'tayra, because now we're doing all the mitzvahs of the Ebishter. Once we have all these things, 
oh, then we could have a beautiful world, which is we're going to be meriting what it says Hashem lemelech al kol The Rebishter is going to be a king of the whole land. What's going to happen then? Hashem, Havaye Echod, the Rebishter is one, Ushmo Echod, even his name, because the Rebishter has more names, everything will become Echod, will go back to its source. This is the beautiful message from Rashi. And if I may just add, as we usually do, a beautiful story from the Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Rebbe, on the concept of Avas Yisrael, unconditional love for another Jew. What does it mean, unconditional love? The Rebbe Rashab had a balagole. He had a coachman. His name was Peshe the Balagole, Peshe, Pesach. But they used to call him Peshe the Balagole. What is interesting is, Peshe was a very simple guy. But Peshe was in Cheder together with the Rebbe Rashab when they were little children. They were together in Cheder. And then later, the Rebbe Rashab became the Rebbe. And Peshe became his Balagole. And one time the Chassidim asked Peshe, Peshe, how is this that the Rebbe became a Rebbe and you became a Balagole? You, you're in the same class. And Peshe said, what's the question? He became what his father is. And I became what my father is. My father was a Balagole. So I became a Balagole. His father is the Rebbe. He became a Rebbe. But one time the Chassidim went over to Pesha, not once, many times, and they asked him, say this from Cheder, if he could tell them secrets from Cheder, you know, from the Rebbe Rashab when he was a child. And Pesha never said a word. But one time they really pushed him hard and they said, Pesha, something epis. So Pesha said, okay, I will tell you. It's very strange, this Rebbe. I never understood him. He loves black bread with knobble, with, um, with uh, garlic. What do you mean he loves black bread with garlic? He says, in Cheder we had the rich children and the poor children. The Rebbe Rashab came from a rich family, the Rebbe Marash was very rich. And he used to come every single day with white bread and jam, which is very expensive. I was from the poor ones, Balagola, so I brought black bread and garlic. And every single day, the Rebbe Rashab would come over to me in a secret. He would say, patient, do me a favor. Switch the sandwich with me. I want the black bread and the uh, knobble and the uh, garlic, and you have this uh, bread and jam. And Pesha says, I never understood this. How can a child rather want black bread with knobble, with the garlic, and give up his sandwich? He's a very strange Rebbe. This was the Avas Yisrael of the Rebbe Rashab. He saw that another child has something less than him, so he begged him, as if he's doing him a favor, to switch with him. This is what the Pesach is saying. We cannot thank the Eibishter if there's someone who still doesn't have. There has to be achdus Yisrael. We all have to feel each other. We all have to make sure that everybody has everything. And the moment we have achdus Yisrael, then there's achdus ha'olam, and then there's Hashem echad echad. And this is also the reason why the Rebbe, in the later years, started all these miftsoim to bring achdus Yisrael. For example, he said that everyone should have a letter in the Sefer Torah. Because this way, in a Sefer Torah, everybody is me'uchad, everybody is united together. And the same thing the Rebbe started with Rambam. That everybody should learn Rambam because this way we are all Be'achdus learning the same subject, Kola Teira Kula, etc. And this way when we have Achdus Yisrael and then we manage to do Achdus Ha'olam and through this we are going to have Hashem Echad Ushma Yechad. Any questions so far? How does the Rambam do Achdus Yisrael? We discussed it in a different time, but uh, very briefly, what the Rebbe requested that throughout the year we finish the whole Rambam because that learning the Rambam is Kol HaTayra Kula, the whole Taira. And uh, there's a concept that every Nishama has to come down to finish the concept of all the 630 mitzvahs. Now, the way to finish the whole Rambam in a, year, in a little less than a year is you learn three chapters every single day. But not everybody could do that. So that's why you could either learn three chapters a day or one chapter a day and you finish it in three years. But then the Rambam, when he wrote his Sefer, he also wrote a Sefer HaMitzvah. The Sefer HaMitzvah also discusses all the 630 mitzvahs. And he wrote it in Arabic 
Because he says this he wrote for the people who don't have the time to go to Shiva or for children or for people who never learned. And this way they could learn the Sefer mitzvahs, which is every mitzvah very briefly, and they have basically all the 630 mitzvahs. So the way the Rambam works is that the portion that they learn in the three chapters, let's say they're learning in the three chapters the Hilchus Shabbos, so then in the Sefer mitzvahs they also learn the Halachas of Shabbos. And this way everybody is learning the same Halachas. And by the way, this always falls out in Chodesh Elul. Elul, as we know, has different Rosh Tevis and that Izzah says. But one of them is Ish Lere'ehu Umatonis Levyonim. What is the concept of Ish Lere'ehu Umatonis Levyonim? What it says in the Megillah, that each one gives presents to the other. Achdus Yisrael, the Yidin get together. The Yidin are united. That is the whole idea. And this is what Rashi is telling us. When you'll come to the land and you want to thank the Ebishter, no, you have to wait till after everybody gets their portion. And then, when we have Achtus Yisrael, that is when we can bring Bikurim to the Ebishter. And then, through all our beautiful Aveda of Achtus Yisrael, Achtus Atayra, Shleimus Atayra, we are going to merit to be in the Beis Amigdash Ashlishi, Teikef Umiyad Mamish, in Ha'aretz Asher Hashem Olekech Onesu Lecha, to the complete land of Eretz Yisrael HaShleima. And we're going to be there, Teikef Umiyad Mamish, and we'd like to wish everyone a ksiva and vachasim ateva, that we should all be inscribed for a good and sweet year, for a year of the Geulah Shleimah.